Um, look, I always like to start with a story and um, I couldn't find a, a photo of um, my jackarooing days, so I put this up. Um, but, but the background of the story is, so I, I worked um, on a pastoral place a few, well, it's quite a few years ago now, and, um, and, and the intent of this story is just to tell you how dire the labour situation is in, in agriculture at the moment. Um, anyhow, we had this sort of camp trailer, so you go out and um, camp and we'd take our swags and everything and we had this sort of, it was like two Toyota tray lengths long and it had this A-frame off it and normally only the really competent operators could trail that trailer and one day they said, right, well, the head stockman's not around, we're going to have to give the, delegate the responsibility to you two clowns. Um, and, you know, just make sure you get it there. So it had our fridge and all the important things we were out for, you know, a, a month at a time or whatever. Anyhow, we were driving along and we sort of got to yarning and we picked up a bit of pace and um, I, was, I was sort of chatting to the bloke and he was driving and I looked out the window and I said, Bakes, is that the camp trailer that's overtaking us? He looked out and said, yep, that's it. And the A-frame, the, the front of the A-frame just dove into the ground and thankfully back onto the turntable and landed on its feet, but obviously the, the A-frame was underneath the vehicle. Um, needless to say that we sort of got reprimanded and that um, delegated authority was never given to us again. But what that highlights is just the, um, the type of thing we're dealing with in agriculture, either you can get um, completely incompetent people like myself involved in your business or you can sort of really think about how to do some things differently and a lot of what I talk about today will really be focused on that labour um, sort of space. Um, so this project, what we, what we actually did in the project is just looked at um, a number of goat enterprises. So it was free to be involved, we asked people to be involved and we were looking at their financial data and their production data and here's where the data came from. It's mainly meat producing goats that was medium to high rainfall producers and that data I've taken out for today because it's relatively um, useless to you guys and girls in the room. Um, we had fenced, uh, managed, unmanaged and even some trading um, herds but we didn't have um, any depots involved in this data set. Um, so we just allocated some DSE ratings and DSE ratings are just really about you know, understanding the energy content relative to the feed. There's not much to see there but I guess the key message really from this slide is just that um, for all intents and purposes, if you're taking some key messages out of this, roughly speaking across your herd, one goat equals one DSE, roughly speaking. That's probably the easiest way to think about it. So when I'm thinking about financial key performance indicators, I'm really thinking about, um, I like to think of them as the dashboard, like the dashboard of my car. When I'm driving in a vehicle, I'm sort of, I've got lots of indicators. I've got the speedo, I've got the um, taco, I've got the fuel gauge, I've got the temperature gauge. Each of those things is telling me a different piece about the efficiency of driving a vehicle. And that's exactly the same in your farm business. You know, what we collected was some, some financial key performance indicators, which told us a bit about the perform financial performance of your business. But we also looked at um, the production key performance indicators. And they were things like stocking rate, number of kilos per head sold, number of kilos per hectare, those sorts of things, and labour efficiency. And those sorts of things really are all telling you a little piece of the picture. They're all like the dashboard of your farm. So I'm going to show you a few of those now. Um, and when I talk about financial key performance indicators, this is really what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about gross profit, which is just income or sales, less purchases, plus the value of inventory change. And in, in non-managed herds, we really had made some assumptions about sales relative to the total number um, on hand, and there would be no purchases if you weren't bringing genetics into the, into the business. Um, and then inventory change is just closing numbers relative to opening numbers. So gross profit, less enterprise expenses, and the typical enterprise expenses in your business um, really were around sales cost and freight costs in that case. 
Um, and then uh, that gets you to gross margin. Deduct your overhead costs. So your overhead costs are the cost of doing business there, your things like repairs and maintenance, depreciation, uh, labour. And regardless of whether you pay yourself in the business, we allocated you a, 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 an allocation, standard allocation for labour. Um, and insurance and all those sorts of things. And that got us to operating profit. So that's really where we stop. We're really interested in the operating performance of your business. Um, now, we know that that's not where it does stop for you, and that's not the bit you get to take home either. That's not necessarily cash. Um, you know, what have you got on top of that? You've got your finance and lease costs, assuming you're funded with um, debt, not equity. Uh, you got your tax costs and that gets you to net profit after tax and you think, great, that's the bit I get to take home. Well, no, it's not um, because then you got your capital costs, um, you got your debt principal, you d the banks do want to be paid back sometime about apparently. Now it's probably not a great time because interest rates are so low, that might change very shortly or already is. Um, and then you've got provisioning costs and other things. And that tiny little bit at the end, if it's not negative, is what you get to take home. Um, but we were worried about what's going on on, on the far side of this slide. Um, so we looked at, um, we tried to get the same businesses over time. It wasn't exactly that easy. So some were new entrants to the industry and might have only had three years of data. Some had five years of data. And there are people in the room who, can, um, who actually committed to this study. So I appreciate their input into it. So there's roughly 100,000 goats a year. Um, or rangelands goats in the data set. Um, and uh, what we've got here is just, then, then we compared them, um, the profit with other enterprises. Now, it, I've just got to give you a caveat on this slide, and that is that um, the profit, we looked at the profit from rangelands goats um, but all those other enterprises are not just rangelands businesses. So that's benchmarking data from a different data set. So you're not exactly comparing like for like, but it is an insightful um, sort of story nonetheless. And uh, so along the left-hand axis, we've got um, it profit or operating profit in dollars per DSE running from zero to 30. And along the bottom axis, we've got the enterprise, which are dual purpose um, sheep enterprise. And we, in that data set, a dual purpose sheep enterprise is a merino joined to a terminal sire. It's not your sort of merino dual purpose type sheep. Um, wool growing sheep, and they're reason the majority of that data set is reasonably fine and a real wool focus. Then um, goats is next, perform next in terms of ranking for profit over that five year period from 2016 to 2020, which is when we had the data. Um, and then we have beef and then lamb. And um, I was fronted the other day at Longreach with the lamb statistics and someone said, well, you got your data wrong. Um, and I said, well, I'm not sure that it's wrong, that the numbers are the numbers. Um, that might be different in your business, which is fine. These prime lamb enterprises are actually reasonably high rainfall. And it is important to note that if you're in a prime lamb system, which might be a dorper in this rangeland environment, you're not going to have the same cost structure because the majority of those are actually shorn. And that adds 10 bucks a head um, with shearing and crutching into that. So you will have a lower cost of production to that. But the message for lamb is, I think, um, there's a bit of work to do in the lamb industry because as, as the prices are doing this, everyone thinks they're making more money. Guess what? The cost base is going along with it at the same rate. So the margins haven't changed in the last 10 years, even though the prices have done this. So if you're a lamb producer, um, you know, really think about your cost structure relative to um, that income line. Don't just look at the income line, look at your income with your cost structure. The income line sells newspapers. Um, you know, the back page of the land is a, is a classic. You know, lambs are making this or goats are making this or whatever. But you really got to think about your cost structure, not just the, imp um, the income side. Um, so the other features, I guess, we found were this is um, margin. So uh, dollars per kilo for every kilo produced is the line there. And there's three lines. The lamb is the orange line. Uh, the green line is goat and beef is the blue line. And what you see there from 2016 to 2020 is beef margins dropped over time. And that's not that surprising because if you think of the drought period during that, um, you know, when you get a drought in beef, it really hurts more so than other enterprises. And that's effectively what that blue line is, is sort of showing. And then 
Um, lamb, you can see the margin isn't as good as goat. And when you run that over um, the five year average period, you know, goats have performed pretty well. Uh, incidentally, I've, I've obviously put beef on the same axis. Typically, beef is a sold live weight, but I've turned it into carcass weight here. So, um, just to allow for a like a like for like comparison, so you can see that the um, the margin in um, lamb uh, in goats have been particularly good and certainly surpassing um, uh, lamb and beef. Um, so the other thing uh, that I think is a great feature of of goats relative to those other enterprises is cost of production. So here we've got um, beef on the on the right hand most side as you're looking at this slide, lamb in the middle and goat on the left hand um, part of that slide and on the left hand axis we've got uh, cost of production running to, from zero to six kilos and really when we talk cost of production what we're trying to encourage you to think of is what's my cost of production relative to my price received because the bit difference between the two is the bit you get to keep. Um, and so you know you can see that, that um, goat has been reasonably high over that period and that does concern me because you don't have a lot of control over any of these commodity prices and assuming you take a commodity based approach then um, you know keeping this as low as possible is a real key to, to, to business performance and the, typically the way you do that is th through the production side more so than the, than the cost structure. Um, but in the rangelands, it's actually a bit of both. It's really important that you, you know, on top of your cost structure. Um, the story of land values is an interesting one. And, you know, um, so dollars per DSE on the left-hand axis here. And typically what you see in the rangelands environment, which is the, which is the green line, um, is you see disparity relative to the high rainfall um, areas, which is the white line in this case. And, that's not um, that surprising. Because, why? Because you know, you're in a remote area, it's harder to get labour, it's further for freight, all those sorts of things have an impact on, um, on uh, you know, land values. And so here I have taken a few outliers out, but what you do see there is growth either way and they track each other. Um, I did put in 21 um, and I had 700 in, per DSE in the rangelands. You may say I'm dreaming now. Um, that was the start of 21 and a thousand bucks in the high rainfall area. It's pretty hard to get country around us for a thousand bucks a DSE. I reckon they'd be lining up pretty deep at the moment for that. Um, now, whether that's a sensible thing to do or not is a different story. Um, so the, the, you know, the really interesting thing is that's over that period, that's 11% compounding level of growth. Um, and if you take in that year, that's 15% compounding. So if you get an outlying year that's exceptional, obviously you, you, know, you weight the average up. Now this has got multiple issues for you because yes, it's great for passive wealth creation, but it actually makes return on investment harder. Why? Because the bottom line's growing, that is the value of assets under management, at the same profit you're actually declining profitability if you don't, if, if you don't build your profit. So. Um, so the challenge for you is as the bottom line grows, which is your total value of assets under management, is growing the top line. Now price has taken us some of the way, but there's that, that's why you've got to strive for the production efficiencies in your business. Because the bottom, the denominator is going to keep, to keep growing. Your challenge is finding those business efficiencies that really drive the performance in the business just to maintain the same level of profitability. Um, so what does that look like in terms of operating return? Exceptional. So that's goat is the um, green line, rangelands goat, and the other line is the industry data set from a high rainfall area, average versus average, 5.8% um, operating return from the rangeland producers that I had in that data set, um, relative to 36 from the high rainfall. So, you know, there's a great story there. Why is that? Well you know, lower land values but, but higher profit per DSE gives you that sort of um, result. So um, I know I'm, uh, when we talk about pr production benchmarking, what is it? I just like to think of, you know, a footy, footy example. Here we've got Dusty Martin going head-to-head -head against Patrick Dangerfield and um, 
you know, I can just imagine prior to them getting on the field, they don't just walk out to the field, you know, they're doing a fair bit of study on each other prior um, the, in the week, in the lead up. Why? Because they want to exploit the benefits that they've got over their opposition. And that's exactly what we're doing when we're production benchmarking. We want to find what those best producers are doing and we want to, you know, we want to emulate it. That's exactly what we're doing. So we look, took out just that cohort which was highly profitable and we tried to examine what they were doing differently to the others and that's what I'll present now. Um, so this is basically on the left hand axis there I've just got dollars per DSE running from zero to 70 and along the bottom axis I've got gross profit, enterprise expenses, overhead costs and profit and, um, which is EBIT there. Um, so the first thing to take away, so we've got the green is the best rangeland and the um, white are the rest of the rangelands. And so what you've got here is the best doing slightly better income wise, no difference in enterprise cost, but have a look at that overhead cost line. The overhead cost difference between the, um, the best and the rest of the group is 20 bucks relative to you know, whatever that is, 43 bucks a DSE. It's a pretty significant difference. So when you boil that down at the profit line, a lot of that, or some of that, you know, a little bit's coming from, from the income side, but a lot is coming from this overhead cost line. And a lot of that's about how you run your own businesses. Um, so what does drive a, lo a low cost? I mean, the reason I told you about how useless I was as a jackaroo was A, because it was an interesting anecdote, but more importantly, that's what you're dealing with is a labour labor deficiency in the part of the world that you are in. And it's no different no matter what industry you're in at the moment. Um, but the interesting thing about this slide is labour efficiency. Um, this is, we've just got, you know, 10,000, the, the best are doing around 10,000 goats per per labour unit, FTE just stands for full time equivalent, and the rest are doing 6,600. That's a difference in efficiency between the two cohorts. You look at gross profit per labour unit, the best are doing are generating twice the income from one person relative to the rest. That's a difference in labour and the way you run your businesses. Um, labour and contractors were $7.20 versus $18.20 in this white line and labour related costs. So you don't just have a labour unit, you've got a labour unit with a vehicle, with fuel, with depreciation. They're the labour related costs. So they're ones to focus on. Again, $5.30 versus $7.80 a DSE. So there's some real things you can do there in my view. Um, the next part was, was this. I found this really insightful um, and that is what What's different about these two? The first line there is general repairs and maintenance, and the second one is depreciation. On the left-hand axis, it's just um, the cost in dollars per DSE. But what we found was the best had a lower repairs and maintenance line and a lower depreciation line than the rest. What's that mean? Well, it probably means, and I'm not exactly sure, but it probably means that they're investing in infrastructure so that they're not chasing their tail. You know, those things that, you know, that, that consume your time from an overhead cost structure are the maintenance, the waters, the, all those things. If you invest in the infrastructure and do it well up front, you can actually save a lot of time in these depreciation and, and repairs and maintenance sort of lines. Um, so what are the other areas? Well, all, all I've done in this graph, the way you read this graph is we've got a number of key performance indicators along the left there from cost of production, price received and so on. And you notice so far, I haven't once focused on price received and I won't. And the reason I won't is because you're in a commodity business and, and you, know, you don't have a lot of say around that price received. So it's interesting to observe the differences but your ability to influence it is very low. But you've got a lot of ability to influence things like cost of production and your cost structure and the amount of production. So along the left-hand axis there, we've got those key performance indicators. The actual numbers are the best, and this is presented as a deviation from that zero line. So the average is always zero, and this shows you how much the best deviated positively or negative against the average. So $3.75, what's that saying is they, were, they had a 40% lower cost of production relative to the average. They did receive um, a higher price than the average. 
There was no difference in production between the two. They had slightly lower production per DSE. Um, their scale was far larger. Don't worry about that. There was, a real, there was one producer with really small scale, but still had really high labour efficiency. How do you do that? Well, you don't spend every minute on the enterprise. You just match your scale to the business. Um, gross profit, they were considerably higher. Labour efficiency we talked to, and return on assets managed three times the magnitude in the, is the difference. But the other thing I just wanted to, and I'm getting into the final slides now, is th there's actually more, one, more than one pathway to profit. And I think this is a really interesting insight into, um, into what the more profitable did. So what we've pulled out here is there was a high production pathway and a really low cost pathway. So the first um, lines there are gross profit. And what you notice there is the high production pathway really was rewarded on the income side. And then you've got that, that low cost pathway where they were just really focused and probably more like your unmanaged herds um, that really focused on having a good cost structure. So either way, you can get there. Um, it's fine, you know, there's a pathway for everyone in this business um, and not much difference between the two in profit, but still far better than the average, which, it, which isn't shown in that slide. And then you have a look here and have a look at the cost of production. So here, sure, they generated more production, which is the high production line, the first um, column, but the low cost ones were still far lower in terms of the cost of production. Um, price received, they did better in the high production relative to low cost. It's probably a function of lower kilos and, um, and, and uh, maybe more underweights there. Um, and the only other thing I really wanted to focus on there, well, there's not too much else in that data. So the um, gross profit per labour unit was exactly the same between those cohorts. So there is two pathways. Don't get tied up if you're not managing your herd at the moment. But if you are planning to go down that management pathway, just realise there's a cost associated with that, that improving the genetics and um, that sort of thing. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it but just be aware that you're gonna need a, a bit more and it could be a big infrastructure cost as well. Um, so what are the key benchmarks that I took out for, for managed enterprises? I think these are some pretty good targets. Income, 130 bucks per goat sold at um, $8.10. Um, if you can do greater than 16 kilos for a managed herd, I think you, that should be a target. Um, in unmanaged, you probably won't achieve that from the data that I've looked at. Greater than 12,000 goats managed per, per labour unit. Um, and if you can keep your cost structure down to 30 bucks a DSE, then I think you've got a real hope for being highly profitable in this industry. Um, so take home messages. I think the first one is know your numbers. I think um, part of the challenges I think we're, we're facing in the industry are, um, there's a lot of anecdote and innuendo out there and a lot of stories. Now stories are great, but it's also good to sort of couch, a bit, get a bit of data behind you as well. So if you can, I know that doesn't improve your labour efficiency, but if you can collect as much data as you can, it's great. Um, genetics and weight gain data, um, you know, I don't know whether there's a really efficient way to do that. That's probably back to others that are smarter than me, which isn't hard. Um, invest in labour efficiency, I think really, you know, investing in labour efficiency, there is some real value there at the moment, and we're seeing really good returns on investment, which is probably no surprise to you because you're, you're in a part of the world where you know that's what you've got to do. So I'm going to leave it there and hand back to the chair, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and um, certainly if there's questions, I'm willing to take them. <laughs>